everyone, and this is BioPhoenix here, and today we're going to be taking a look at an RPG series, and that happens to be Brandish. And this series was created by Neon Falcom, yep, the same company that made the East games and even the Legend of Heroes series. So in total, there is only four main entries, but I'm only going to take a look at two of them. But as an added bonus, I will also be taking a look at one of the remakes. But one thing I do want to mention before we start talking about the games is that the artwork for this series is pretty damn awesome looking. And one of the things that I really like about it is that it has a good mixture between an anime style and a style that feels very westernized, which I did thought was pretty interesting. In fact, the box covers of all the games all looked really great. And shockingly enough, the Super Nintendo version that came out in North America, the box art was left the same, which is pretty awesome because it's actually one of my many favorite box arts for the Super Nintendo. But yeah, I figured I'd get that out of the way since the box art is usually going to be your first impression, especially if you saw something like this back in the day, but yes. So the first one we're going to be taking a look at is the Super Nintendo version of Brandish. And like I already said, this one actually got a North American release, where the other versions unfortunately did not. But in case you're wondering what other versions there are, there is the PC-9801, the FM Towns, and the PC Engine CD. And there is a remake, which I will talk about much later. So the SNES version was released in 1995 in North America, and believe it or not, it was actually published by Koei. I never would have imagined to see their logo on a Neon Falcom game. Well, this brings me a great idea, maybe they should make a Warriors Trails of the Sky... The, I don't fucking know, man. Anyways, I would just get back on track and start talking about the game story. So you play as a character named Ayers, or in this version, he is named as Varric. And he's chasing after another character named Della, or in this version, her name is Alexis. So they get into a fight, and then as they are fighting, they end up uh, breaking the ground and end up falling into a big, huge pit where it ends up being like an entire dungeon. And that's where the game begins. Now there is a lot of backstory with this game where apparently like the dungeon that they fall into it used to be a town that was protected by a giant like tower where a dragon was living up there and then like some dude like was like trying to kill the dragon and a bunch of shit happens but I'm not here to talk about that though but that pretty much sums up that whole thing. But as you might be able to tell it's one of those RPGs where the story is really not the most important reason why you play it. So now let's get moving on to the gameplay. So it's a top-down view dungeon crawler, and you go through giant mazes, and you open up chests, you can get items, you can get gold, and of course you can uh, enter in shops where you can buy uh, various things. So it's pretty standard dungeon crawling stuff, but the one thing I really have to mention here, because it is one of the first things you're going to notice as soon as you play this game, is that the way how the camera angle works is really fucking weird. So your character is always facing forward, but every time you turn, while your character doesn't turn around, it's the map that turns around. And I remember when I first played this game, I actually got really nauseated from it. But after a little while though, you do get used to it, and it doesn't get as nauseating, but it's still a very strange concept. So knowing how that works, the walking kind of feels a little bit like a roguelike, but only that like everything is moving around. And the levels are not randomly generated, so you don't need to worry about that. And one important thing to mention is that this game will test your item inventory skills. For that, not only is your uh, inventory uh, limited, but also your weapons can actually break in this game. So you gotta make sure that you keep all the swords that you can, and whenever one breaks, you gotta sell it afterwards. But one good thing to know is that if you do drop other items, they don't disappear. So at least you can always come back and get them when you can. So now, let's start taking a look at the game's controls, and all I gotta say is that they take a lot of time to get used to, let me tell ya. So B allows you to jump a step forward, and the A button is to attack, but the way how it works is that you gotta press the attack button at the right time, and as soon as you're attacking, you just gotta keep tapping the A button until the thing dies. If you do it too late, then you're just gonna hold up your shield. The X button allows you to use items that are equipped to you, and the Y button brings up this hand which indicates that you can take an item or open up a chest or a door. And the L and R buttons allow you to switch between a take option and the examine option. But if you hold one of those buttons and then press left or right then you can strafe. And by the way that took me such a long time to figure that out the first time. 
And one interesting mechanic you can do is that if you press L and R at the same time, then your character will just go to sleep. And when he does so, you gain back some health and MP back, but you can't attack whatsoever and enemies are still moving around and they can actually destroy your ass while you're sleeping. So you only want to use it when you know there's no enemies around. And then select brings up the item screen and start allows you to go through like the different option menus, the map, and also saving your game. And by the way, you can actually save your game anywhere you want in the game, so at least that makes things really easy. And another thing I thought that was kind of neat is that you can actually change the color scheme of your character. But yeah, once you know this, the controls are actually not bad, they are actually responsive, but like I said though, when you first play this game going into it blind, it is a little confusing to figure out. But I really wish that LNR just allowed you to just do automatic strafing, and then Y should just act as like a regular like action button that whether it be an examine or just taking whatever. That just would have made things a hell of a lot easier. But despite this though, it's actually not bad once you know how the game works. But as I said, it did take me a little while to finally get used to it. So now let's move on to the other things like the graphics, and the graphics in this one are unfortunately, they're uh, not that great. So all the backgrounds in the game are just kinda dull, and the monster designs are pretty generic looking, nothing too crazy. But I will admit, the cutscene at the beginning did look pretty good. But other than that, for a game that came out over here in 1995, and by the way this came out in Japan in 94, it definitely could have looked a lot better. And I've actually looked at screenshots for some of the other versions, and I actually think they look a lot better, at least everything is much more bright and colorful looking. But yeah, it's kind of disappointing considering that the art direction for the game is pretty awesome looking, and yet graphically the game just looks kind of meh. But I have seen way uglier Super Nintendo games out there, so it's not the worst, but I think it could have looked a lot nicer. So now, as for the game's music, I find the music in this game is actually pretty good. Now as to be expected from Neon Falcom, they always had some damn fucking awesome OSTs. But as for the music in this version though, I do think it is pretty good, but I definitely don't think it's their best work ever, but at least it does fit the game very well. Although I know some might complain that you're going to hear a lot of the same songs over and over again, but I can understand that, but it never bothered me personally, because at least the songs that you do hear over and over again are not too annoying. So it may not be on the same level as East or Legend of Heroes or just the Dragon Slayer series in general, but it's still a pretty good one. Now I'm going to do the whole if you want to buy this game segment at the end of this video, so now let's get moving on to my overall thoughts on this game. So I think that the Super Nintendo version of Brandish is, surprisingly, it's actually kinda decent. Now I know this might sound surprising to some of you out there because I've heard a lot of people say that this is like one of the worst Super Nintendo RPGs you can play, and personally, nah, I definitely don't think it's that bad. But I do think this game does have a lot of flaws though, and I will get to that. So there's a lot of things in this game that takes a lot of time to get used to, whether it be the controls and just the way how like the game works. So it's the kind of game that you have to have a lot of patience to play it because goddamn, this game can get really fucking frustrating. But as frustrating as it is, it is actually a little bit fair in a lot of aspects where at least you do have that sleeping option which allows you to gain your health and MP back up. And being able to save anywhere you want in the game is truly a godsend because I can't imagine playing this game while having like limited save points. But the one part in this game that really does piss me the fuck off is this one like little puzzle thing where you gotta like avoid like these like pitfalls and you gotta avoid like, these spikes coming out of the walls. But here's my main problem with it. So when you first enter in this room, you're automatically gonna get pushed to the side and you're gonna get fucking killed. But then if you turn yourself around and look back, you realize that the very first step you take into this little corridor, there's a spike right there. But look, you can't see it when you're looking right here because this shit's in the fucking way. Now even though I did say that the game's controls do work pretty well for this kind of game, well unfortunately one thing I didn't mention, and I saved it till this part, is that why in the hell does this game require platforming skills? What the fuck? But yeah, as frustrating as some of the parts in this game can be, at least you can save right before there and then, so it actually doesn't take you long to get back to where you once were. But the game is still really tough, and because of that, I wouldn't recommend this game for beginners. In fact, I really wouldn't really recommend it to most people. 
because as a dungeon crawling RPG, I think there's way better ones out there, but I don't think this one is bad. In fact, there's actually a few parts in this game I actually did kind of like and I was actually digging into. So yeah, Brandish on Super Nintendo is just an okay game. It's not great, but it's also not bad either. But I can understand why people would hate this game for that. It is definitely a very frustrating one that does have a lot of learning curves. But I still think it is a hell of a lot better than Secret of the Stars on Super NES, so yeah, definitely not the worst on the system. So now let's take a look at that remake that I mentioned earlier, and that happens to be Brandish the Dark Revenant on the PSP. And I just realized, this is my first PSP game review. But anyways, this game was also developed by Neon Falcom, and it was published by Xseed. And it can be played on both PSP and the Vita. And because this is a remake of sorts, I can only talk about so much, since I've already talked about most of the stuff that you need to know, like the story. But if there's anything I can mention about the story in this version, is that not only is it more faithful to the original translation, but also uh, there is a lot more dialogue in between uh, certain scenes. One example is that as soon as you get over that first door, you can actually see a guy on the ground that you get to talk to, which was not in the original one. So it does add a few extra things to make it a little bit more in-depth, but it's still not the kind of game that you play for the story, since the story is still very basic stuff, which works fine. And the gameplay is also very much the same, where that it is still a, uh, a dungeon crawler from an above view. And one of the biggest improvements is that it doesn't have that weird as shit camera angle bullshit. Also, the heads-up display in this game is very clean looking and is also very easy to manage, and you even get shortcuts. And you don't need to pause the game in order to look at the map in this one. Although you can view an enlarged version of it where you can actually draw down uh, different notes to tell you like anything that you missed, whether it be like a locked door and such, so that does make things easier. And all the other basic features from the other games, such as like the sleeping, the game back your health, and also the like saving anywhere and anytime you want is also still present. But one newer addition that they do have with this one is that you can actually play as Della in this one and she actually has some extra missions, but you can only access it after you beat the, the main story. And one other new thing that was added into this one is that you can also play the game Blades, which in case you don't know what that is, that is the card game that also appears in the Trails series. Hmm, makes me wonder if this game takes place in the same universe. So now let's take a look at the game's controls, and this time, well as you would suspect, they are a lot better. So the button layout this time actually makes a lot more sense, and actually does work really well. So doing the strafing is exactly what you would suspect, pressing R and L. And I have to say, that little extra simplicity to it really does make the fighting in this game much more easier and manageable. Because the fighting in this game still works the same way how it does in the original game, but you can tell that this one just feels a lot more refined. And in case you're wondering how you do the shortcuts in this game, well you just hold uh, either direction of the analog stick, whether it be down, left, or right, and you press triangle and there you go. So yeah, overall the controls in this one are just so much better. So now let's take a look at the other things, like the graphics. So as you would suspect for a remake, this game does indeed look a lot better, but that's kind of a no shit thing going from a Super Nintendo to a PSP. But even for PSP standards, this is still really good looking. So the character models this time are much more detailed, and they are very recognizable, and I do think they do look really good. And the character portraits within the uh, conversations that happen still look really good as you would suspect. But as for the background textures, I do think they do look pretty good for what they are, but at the same time, they are still a little bit dull looking, but I think it does fit with the background of what it's supposed to be. But one complaint I can understand is that you are going to be seeing a lot of the same backgrounds over and over and over again, so it is a little bit repetitive to look at, but it's not terrible. But one other thing I did thought was kind of interesting is that the cracks in the walls that you have to open up with using sledgehammers are actually a lot more harder to look at in this one compared to the Super Nintendo one where they are much easier to see. Now there's two ways to look at this, it can be better in the sense that like it makes the game a little bit more challenging because you know, hidden cracks in the walls are not supposed to be super obvious. But it can also be looked at as a bad thing in that it just makes it a more pain in the ass than it needs to be. Well, either way you look at it, it's a very valid uh, reasoning. But as for me, I just do like the way that this game looks, and I do think it is a pretty good looking remake for the PSP. But then again, there's like a ton of remakes of older games on the PSP. 
So of course, it's not the best looking remake you can get on the system, but still pretty good otherwise. Now as for the game's music, well holy fuck. Okay, so the music in the SNES version was still really good, in fact there is quite a few tracks in there that I do really like, even though you don't get to hear them as often. But this version really kicked it up to like 20 notches and holy shit it really does. Let me just show you a little comparison between the two of one of my favorite tracks in the game. Now that's the badass Neon Falcom that I know. So yeah, overall, I have no complaints whatsoever. The music in this game is just amazing shit. So as for my overall thoughts on The Dark Revenant, is that this game is just a really good remake and does improve pretty much almost every uh, complaint that I had with the original game. But does that still make it like an amazing like dungeon crawling RPG? Well personally, I don't think it's the greatest one ever, but I do think it is a really solid one. Now remember what I said about the combat in this game is a lot easier to get used to? Well believe it or not, this game still knows how to be really brutal. But I think this one is a lot more fair of its difficulty where not only do you get a lot of advantages like, you know, saving anywhere and being able to sleep wherever the fuck you want as long as you don't sleep in an area with a bunch of enemies that can kill your ass. But the main important thing of why I think this one is much more fair, even more so than the Super Nintendo one, which all those other things you can also do, is that there's not as much as a learning curve here. So I find that going through like the dungeons in this game and being stuck at a part does feel a lot more satisfying to complete. Also, remember like not that long ago I bitched about like that spike coming out of the wall part in the Super Nintendo one? Well in this game, well look, you can actually see what the fuck you're doing now. Also, they're not spikes in this one, they're just logs that push you around, and yeah, this part is still kind of annoying, but definitely a lot more easier than the other one. So some of the funky platforming parts are a lot more easier to manage in this one, which is another plus. Also another good thing about this one that also uh, would be easier for newer comers is that they actually put in a tutorial level to help you learn the basics. So yeah, this one is definitely a great improvement, and I would recommend it to more people more so than the Super Nintendo version. So let's get moving on to the last game I'm going to mention here, and that happens to be Brandish 2 The Planet Buster. So as again, it was developed by Neon Falcom, and it was also published by Koei again, but this one was not released outside of Japan. And this version came out in 1995. And the PC-98 version came out in 93, but I have to stick to the Super Nintendo one because that's the only one I was able to get a fan translation of. Apparently there is one for the PC-98 version, but I can't seem to find it anywhere. So as you might imagine, the story in this one is a direct sequel to the first game where you still play as the character Ayers. And it turns out after the first game, spoiler alert if you actually give a shit, he has acquired a sword called the Planet Buster where, if you can imagine, it can actually destroy planets. Now goddamn, that's OP. So it turns out after traveling in a desert, he ends up getting kidnapped by a warlock named Carl. Yeah, how does a guy with a sword that can destroy planets get kidnapped by some random warlock? I don't fucking know how that works. So he ends up getting thrown in jail and get beaten the shit out of, and that's where the game begins. 
So the first area of the game, you're just trying to escape, but eventually at the end of it all, you end up seeing your uh, favorite rival character, Dalla, who actually rescues you. But of course, she has to insult you afterwards by saying that no man can handle her. But yeah, that's pretty much what you need to know about the story. It's the same typical stuff. So now, let's talk about the gameplay, and I'm not gonna try and rehash everything here like I've already said in the first part, because the gameplay here is very similar to the first one. So as you might be able to tell, the heads-up display in this one is a lot better. And whenever you switch weapons in the game by pressing the start button, you can actually, like, pause the game, because if you pause the game in the first game, it didn't actually pause, so you had to, like, make everything quickly, or just, like, hide in a corner or something. But that's only by pressing the start button. By pressing select, you can go through your items, but it doesn't uh, pause the game like that, so keep that in mind. But one really cool idea that you can do in this one that is a new addition is that you can actually dual wield in this game. Also, being able to talk to shopkeepers that you find, there is also a lot more NPCs in the game that you get to talk to. And one thing you might not believe is that this game actually does have a little bit of side quests to do. They're nothing too crazy, but I was really surprised that this game actually had something like this. So while this game is a dungeon crawler through and through, there are some parts of the game that don't really feel like one, which I thought was kind of interesting. So now, let's get talking about the game's controls, and if you heard what I said about the first game earlier on, is that the controls in this one are still the same, so they do feel pretty clunky with coming to uh, understand how they work. But one good thing I will say is that the turning and the camera angles of this game is not nearly as uh, nauseating as it was in the first game. So that is indeed a good improvement, but like I said, the button layout though still takes some time to get used to and is a little bit of a learning curve. Although I do feel that the combat in this game does feel a little bit better. I don't know how to explain it, it just feels a little bit more smooth and the hit detection of it is just a lot better. Except for when you're fighting a bat in this game, then this game just goes bat shit. Yeah, no pun intended, because the bats in this game, I don't know why they're so hard to hit in this game. So yeah, overall, while the controls in this game still do take some time to get used to, there is a few improvements here, and I do think they do work a little bit better. So now, as for the game's graphics, well all I gotta say here is that I do feel they are a lot better looking in this one. Yeah, there is a few parts in the game that do look a little dull, but for the most part though, the game does have a little bit more brighter colors. And the enemies and bosses are a lot more recognizable in this one. And the game's cutscenes are pretty damn good for Super Nintendo standards. Also, one other thing that I do feel is a bigger improvement is that there is a lot more settings in the game, rather than just being inside like a dungeon or a cave the entire time, you actually do see like the outside world a little bit, so that's at least refreshing. So if I say so myself, the graphics in this one are indeed a better improvement. It still may not be the best you'll ever see on the Super Nintendo, but better than what they did before. And now, as for the game's music, as again, the music as you would suspect for Neon Falcom standards, it's still really good. And there is a lot more songs in here that I do find to be pretty damn catchy. Now, the first game did have some catchy tunes, but unfortunately there wasn't a whole lot of them, but this one, I feel like it has more of that. So no complaints here, the music is still really great stuff. So as for my overall thoughts on Brandish 2 is that I do feel that this game is a lot better than the first game on the Super Nintendo. But even though it is a much better improvement, I still don't consider it to be a great dungeon crawler. I do think it is good, but I do think the thing that does draw back a bit is that uh, learning curve with learning how to play. Because just like I said about the first game, it is one of those games that you really have to take a lot of time and a lot of patience to get through most of it. Because even though you do get a lot of advantages, like being able to save wherever you want, and being able to sleep and regain your health at any time, as long as you're in a safe spot, this game is still pretty damn hard, and I know a lot of people that aren't necessarily into this kind of genre, I don't think it would really win them over, but as for someone like myself that is a fan of the type of genre that it is, I do like it, and I do like it enough to say that I like it, but I don't love it enough to say that it's like one of the greatest dungeon crawlers ever. But even during the time of its release, it's really not a bad game at all. I mean, really, my only real complaint with the game is that the button layout does take a lot of time to get used to. But even after getting used to it though, this game still does have its weird shit. 
But one other good thing that I will mention that I forgot to say is that when you do die in this game, it automatically resets you to the last save point so you don't have to go back to the menu and reload your save like that. So it does save you a lot of time, which is really good. But yeah, Brandish 2 is still a good game, but I don't know if I'd recommend it to everyone because, like I've said, not everyone is a fan of dungeon crawlers since they are pretty tough and also do have a lot of puzzles. But if you did happen to like the first game, then I do think you would really like this one a lot more. But I really do wish that they would do a remake of this one someday, but I don't know if it'll ever happen, but you never know. So as for the one thing I never talked about yet, is if you wanted to buy these games, so if you wanted to buy the first game on the Super Nintendo, it's kind of expensive. The cheapest I've seen it for, for a loose cart, was $50, and the highest I've seen it for was a complete in box going for $150. Well, shit, but I guess that's no surprise knowing this day and age. But as for the remake of the first one on PSP, well, that one was only released in Japan for a physical copy, and they are actually pretty cheap, usually going for about $15 to $25. But since it will be coming from Japan, of course, the game will not be in English, but I'm sure there is a way you can probably patch the English onto it, though, since the PSP is easy to hack after all, and I'm sure that is probably a thing you can do. But you can get a digital copy of it over here in North American servers for $20, but it can only be played on the PSP and the PS Vita. Not sure about the PS TV. And as for Brandish 2, if you want an original copy, it's about $50 as well. But there is a lot of reproduction carts out there, so if you want to go that way, then at least there is some available of that, and usually they aren't too expensive. So that's all the games I'm willing to take a look at in this episode. If there is ever fan translations of any of the other uh, Brandish games, I may have to take a look at them in the future, but I don't know how long that will be, because yes, there are other games, such as Brandish 3 and Brandish uh, VT. And there are some updated versions that were only on the PC version, such as uh, Brandish Renewal, and then there was also uh, Brandish 2 Experts. And ironically enough, Neon Falcom also did the same thing with one of the East games being East 5 Experts. So to sum it up, Brandish is a pretty interesting series of games that are pretty good but do have some very mixed results. So I don't consider it to be like the same level as like the East series or the Legend of Heroes series or anything like that, but I do feel they are fairly solid for the most part. It's really just the first game on Super Nintendo that was really mixed, where they had some good things and had some bad things, but yeah, I already went over that. So that'll be the end of this episode, so thanks for watching, commenting, and have yourselves a great day. stayed on.